Do you know of any skeptics in your family, at work, or among your friends? Do you struggle with questions concerning the existence of God or the truth claims of Christianity? Has a skeptic ever challenged you with a difficult question concerning your faith? Then you need to buy Dr. Pendergrass's book, A Skeptic Challenges a Christian, on Amazon.com. You can get it in paperback or on Kindle or in audiobook form to listen to. A Skeptic Challenges a Christian is written unlike any other book. It's not boring and full of technical jargon. It reads like you're sitting down having a conversation. As one reviewer said, As a college student, I absolutely love this book. Dr. Pendergrass knows how to effectively answer a lot of the questions that my friends at school ask about my faith. This book is a great resource for theological debates and for my own personal growth. The arguments are clear and understandable. I would definitely recommend this book to anyone who has questions about Christianity, wants to learn how to defend their faith, or even just wants a good read. Great book! Find out why it has a perfect 5-star rating on Amazon.com. A Skeptic Challenges a Christian. Buy your copies today. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. One of the things that I do when I record my podcast is I wait. Sorry, some of you wish I didn't wait so long if you're, if you're a faithful listener. And it's because there are some things that get me all riled up. And I'm not sure why I need to see a counselor for it. But <laughs> uh, usually my wife... Uh, or maybe my son hears my first go around on certain issues because I just, what? Here's 10 reasons why that's nonsense or whatever. And, and maybe I'm just completely wrong, but I know I am worked up and I don't want to record podcasts as much as I can when I'm too worked up. So I usually dish it out for a long time. Then I wait for several days and then I come back and hopefully I can sound a little more calm and collected. We'll see. And not, not boring, but hopefully calm and collected. Recently, there was a young woman who I think was 37 years old, who died. And she is apparently, was apparently pretty well known amongst certain groups of Christians. I I didn't know her at all. And, and I'm I'm going to mention who it is. If you know who it is, good for you. If not, it doesn't really matter because the point is not so much about her, which I'll get to in a second. My response today is I'm thinking about this notion of progressive Christianity as it, and, and her death, which is certainly sad and tragic. I think she had two kids and again, 37 years old. I'm, I mean, I, my goodness. And I'm sure she was out. She seems to be a very sweet person. People on Facebook and others wrote these long, she was the best thing I've ever experienced in my entire life comments. I mean, it went on and on and on and on about how phenomenal she was. I never heard of her, but then I heard that she did this one thing where she quote unquote lived as a biblical woman for a full year, which I remember that a few years ago. And I, I mean, frankly, I thought that was silly. I, why would a person attempt to live like an ancient Jewish woman, particularly as she did it, more than the New Testament? I, anyway, I, I didn't get that part, but it was the response to it. And she was hailed constantly as a progressive Christian, progressive Christian. Now, again, what I'm saying this the whole podcast is not about her and her life. And apparently, she did some really good, and that's great. What worked me up so much was the comments afterward, the people, the comments about it, and the comments about being progressive. And I don't have maybe a big therefore, but I maybe what it's worth, I just want to reflect on a few things that I read and give some responses to them. What's so striking to me about this, this, I don't say resurgence, but this growing foment over quote unquote progressive Christianity it is very unsettling. But there's some things that seem, it's unsettling, and some things seem like they're all warmed over nonsense, and some things seem very similar. One of the things that, if you don't know this in biblical, this relates. When you go to interpret the Bible, uh, when you when you study it, typically, and this is a generalized way to define it, when you seek to understand the biblical text and its ancient context, we call this exegesis. When you study the text, you know very carefully in the original languages, we try to determine the meaning based on what it meant back then. A different thing is what to do, how to apply it. And that's called hermeneutics. But sometimes people use the word hermeneutics to apply to both processes. What's been popular for about, I don't know, 100 years, I guess, is to have different models, different lenses through which one can look to study the Bible. And for example, and they call these various something theology. Just add the word theology to it. So there's black theology. There is liberation theology. There's feminist theology. And and what that does is when you look at the text, you go in looking for very particular things. Whether it's there or not, 
<laughs> you're going to find them somewhere here and there. And then you come out and say, see, it was there all along. And because you didn't notice it, it demonstrates how bad A, B, C, or X, Y, Z was all along. So feminist theology has come back and say, notice how no one ever talks about the women. Well, that's false. Certain authors might not talk about women much, but it's just not true in biblical studies that women are never talked about. I know that because of three degrees. People talk about women all the time in the biblical text. I know all kinds of scholars who have devoted their entire careers or chunks of their entire careers focusing, in fact, on how women are treated in the biblical text. You have people who, in black theology, who focused on people they think are African. You have people who... The liberation theology is very, very popular in Latino cultures. Very popular. And that's where you look for anybody who's the underdog and so forth. Well, one of the movements that's been taking place now in the last... I don't know how long. I'm not a specialist on the... Uh, uh, so, uh, sociologist. And that is... But it, it, it it's similar to these other theologies. And that's with this progressive Christianity. It is like a liberation the uh, theology uh, in that you're looking for people who are outcast, people who are the oppressed. That's what liberation theology focuses on, is how the gospel helps those who are poor and indigent, broken down, outcast, ignored, and so forth. And now they're not really called liber liberation theologians. They're called progressive Christians. And it's a subgroup of Protestants, particularly, but not fully. But you don't hear, I don't know of any, maybe they exist, and I'm just, I know I'm ignorant about a lot of things. I've never in my life heard of progressive Roman Catholics. I mean, and I mean, technically speaking, not, not a person who claims to be a Catholic and claims to be progressive. I mean, a movement, an official movement within Roman Catholicism, but it's chiefly, or and certainly not Orthodox tradition, my goodness. But there's certain Protestant groups that are, particularly method, groups of Methodists and some groups of some Baptist groups and non-denominational, and they hail themselves as progressive, 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 progressive. In my experience, uh, a lot of them, when I read from them, and I could read more, but the bit I've read, uh, and I've tried my best to, to read to hear what their views are, a lot of times the motivation for this kind of progressive Christianity, or really it's a, a kind of a warmed over kind of liberation theolo theology, and that is they're trying their best to focus on, again, just like liberation theologians, the outcasts, the oppressed, and so forth, to draw attention to them. They're trying to draw attention to them. So we're trying to draw attention to the black life, to the Asian life, the Mexican life, the gay life, the lesbian life, the whatever life, so that no one else, someone can hear their story. Well, when you join some of that focus of the old school liberation the theology with modern, millennial, a postmodern kind of thing, there's an amalgam of things where basically you, what's really, it seems to me, what ends up happening is we can get a lot of baptized language, but what we're really doing is just adopting leftism. It's it. We're just, we end up being social justice warriors inside the church and say, well, that's what I care about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been in the Bible this whole time. It's been in this Bible the whole time. That's all that Jesus cares about is the oppressed. That's all he cares about is love. That's all he cares about is compassion. That's all he cares about is kindness. That's it. It's been there all along. And where it doesn't say it, it's still there. Why? Because it's the overarching narrative. It's the overarching narrative. It's the overarching. It's That's, that's the main point. And so, these people usually, in my experience, I'm going to keep saying these people. I'm sorry, because I, I could quote individuals and cite them. I, I'm trying not to, I, I'm not doing that right now because I'm concerned that people would think I'm picking on the person. And I'm not picking on the person, I'm picking on the ideas. Because I think the ideas are patent nonsense. But I do think the motivation for most people is a good one. They're trying to care and love for people. And that's great. The problem is, of course, they're, they come to the biblical text with a matrix, a, a type of lens upon which they read the text. And inherently, always, I disagree with that. I think to treat the text with absolute integrity and respect, which I, as a Christian, I think we should, it means not coming to the text with a deliberate agenda. Now, of course, uh, we, we have talks and talks and talks, and there are books on this issue. You cannot read the Bible objectively. You can come to what you think are objective beliefs, but you cannot read it purely objective. I am a person. I am subjective. I come to the text with particular history. I am primarily from the South. I'm a male. I'm white and blah, blah, blah. 
And some of these things might influence my text, uh, my reading of the text, absolutely. But in general, it's abject. If it affects the text, it is subconscious and deep, deep, deep subconscious that it is. The reason why people, sorry, the reason why I got my three degrees is because I wanted not to read the text guided by subconscious principles. I don't care as a white person what an ancient Jew thought and and I have to contrast it or compare it or make it fit to what I believe is a white person. I don't know what that means to think something as a white person. That just sounds stupid to me. I want to know what an ancient Jew believed. I want to know what an ancient Roman believed, ancient Greek person believed. I don't care what I believe. I just don't care. Who gives a rep? When I'm trying to read an ancient text, I want to read the ancient text and I want to hear it like I could time travel. What did Paul mean when he used the word dikaiosuni, righteousness? What did he mean by that word? I don't care that I'm a guy. I don't care. When Jesus spoke to women, when he spoke to men, what did he mean when he said those things? What did When he did that, when he washed their feet in John, what does that mean he did that? I'm not looking for ways for it to fit a narrative that I already like. And so already this idea that I can go to the text trying to look for things that, that I already appreciate or like or value is not using the text as the source of my morality and beliefs and practice. It's not. It's just simply not. It's going to the text with a filter. You're sifting through things that don't fit the preconceived notion. That's very, very problematic for me at least. Another thing I notice about this progressive Christianity, it's, it seems to me in my experience, and maybe it's not your experience, but in my experience, it's just the cool crowd all over again. That's all. It's just the cool crowd. To be the progressive Christian is to be part of the cool crowd. That's it. When I was in high school, the cool crowd of people who smoked, they had their tattoos, they had sex, whatever's on the fringe or breaking the rules, they're the cool crowd. They don't, they don't listen to the rules, man. They're, they're, they're better than that. They're just the cool crowd. That's it. It's just, it's a childish need to rebel. That's all it is. That's all it is. And progressive Christians are rebelling. They're rebelling against conservatives, the bad guys, or the right. Now, notice how the conservatives and the right are almost, in my experience, okay, in my experience reading progressives, they are always associated with mom and daddy or, an, or a church origin. That is, it's always related from an environment. Uh, they're all res- responding to an environment in which they grew up. So it's just the cool crowd all over again. I don't fit in. You know, my parents taught me that they got all, my church just, they just loved having all the answers. They just knew everything. I don't, I'm, I know. I just have questions. I just have questions. I have my doubts. I have doubts and I, you know, I just have doubts and I think that's a good thing. I, what, what, why, why this is a little footnote. Why? And this is one of the chief things that the progressive Christians love to, to hail as this phenomenal insight into reality. And that is we value having questions and doubting. Why is that a value? Why in the world is a disposition of ignorance a good thing? I really mean that. What in the world? If you mean, and if that is the case, I've never heard it this way before. If a person says, I'm open, what I, what I value is trying to figure out if a belief is true or false based on the biblical witness and or the early church witness. That's a good, good thing. Because that's how you challenge your own beliefs. You don't want, it seems to me, I don't want my beliefs to trump the Christian, the early Christian's belief. I want to have, as far as I can understand it, a biblical view of the world, a Christian's view of the world, and when it comes to it, particularly the role of God and God and the kingdom of God and what my purpose on life is. But that's not how I ever hear it talked about. It's not, I have an open mind to correct my views. It's just, I value being a doubter. I value being a doubter. I value asking questions all the time. It just, I dem- <laughs> hey, David, are you married? I don't know. You know, I used to think that. I grew up in an environment of church. I'm married. I'm married. I'm single. I'm married. I'm single. I'm, I'm not that way anymore. You know, there was a time of struggle where I used to really, I just finally gave up. I just don't know anymore. I, you know, when I think about my life, 
I mean, there's a woman who lives in the same house I do. And yeah, we do have children and we did have a ceremony and we do wear rings, but I just, I don't know. I'm open. I'm open. I'm, I'm more of a, a marriage doubter. And I really value having the questions of whether or not I'm married. I think that's a good thing. I think all Christians should abandon their bigoted, closed-minded view of marriage and just, just be open. You don't know. I mean, you don't know, right? You don't know if you're married, right? You know that, right? It's okay. Hey, hey, it's okay to know. It's okay to say that. You know, it took me years to finally say it too. That's how stupid that is to me. I'm married. <laughs> I can't get over this. I can't see. See, this is. I'm sorry. Swusaba. I used. To, I did this for hours. For that's why I waited days. I can't grasp it. It's just the cool crowd all over again. That's all this is. My mom and daddy always said that. My church said and that's another thing. It's very, 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 very common amongst these quote unquote progressive Christians. Is they had to get over the church. They write books on this issue, the how the church burned them. And I, listen, on the one hand, and you, every every once in my podcast, I have mentioned many times that people in the church, Christians, so called Christians, and I think even people who really are Christians, can very much hurt and damage the cause of Christ. I have been betrayed by Christians. I have been hurt the most in my life by people who claim proclaim to be Christians. On the one hand, I completely concur that the church, as the body of believers, can do great damage. Absolutely. However, what I don't do is I don't lump them all together. And that's what I cannot grasp. In my experience, when I've read the literature from progressive Christians, it's just the church. It's not a handful of people in my congregation. It's not even the church in which I went to, and I'm sure other churches are different. It's just because I've had this experience, it's universalized. It's a generalization. That's what I find so very frustrating. Yes, people within the church have hurt me, David, personally a lot. Oh my goodness. But the church, capital C church, has not hurt me. Individual people have. And this whole, I needed to get over my church deal, I, I cannot relate to that. I can't relate. In fact, what it comes across to me is, if honestly, what it comes across to me is, in general, is not that people are reacting to people hurt them. It's more this cool crowd nonsense. I'm rebelling against the powers that be, and the church is the powers that be. And so I had to come through a massive process where I, I hated the church. See, the church gets projected to be a parent. That's all this is. They were my mother and my father, and they disapproved of me, and I disagreed with them, and they wouldn't let me disagree with them. I couldn't talk back, and I finally just said, no, enough is enough, and I quit the church for years and years and years and years and years, and finally, I'm finding myself to come back to the church, but it's not the church I grew up in. No, no, no. It's not my mom and daddy's church. It's queer church. It's when I'm in church, we're called the breakfast table. We're called the echo room. We're called shadowsofdoubt.com because we're not like mom and daddy's church. But of course not. This is just a childish need to rebel. You needed to go to a therapist, not quit the church. You needed to find a new church. Okay, some pastors are punks. I'm sorry about that. I am. I, dude, I really, really am. Dudette. But you don't quit the church because of it. You don't. What you're doing is having a deep... Uh, you. For so many people I've read and I've met and I've heard, what they're doing in psychology is transference. The church leaders become mom and daddy, and they're just rebelling against mom and daddy all over again. Or they're rebelling against the church when they never rebelled against their parents. And they feel permission to rebel against the church, but not permission to rebel against their parents. And so they take it out on the church or the church leaders. And they write blogs and write books and do podcasts and on and on and do speaking tours about how the church and then I had to grow past the church and the new church is different because new church is not at all like those old, hateful, dogmatic bigots are. That's another thing progressive Christians talk about a lot is another point I'm making here is dogma. They are against dogma. They're all for faith. And I always want to say, do you know what the word faith means? It's used in two ways, primary ways in the New Testament. One is a reasonable trust. I have faith in, and you have faith that. You have faith in Jesus. You have faith in my wife. You put your trust in a person. You have faith that is used as an object. That is the content of beliefs. 
content of beliefs. That faith is what's passed down when Paul talks about faith being passed down. What do you think it means? What do you think the word dogma means? But see, you can't believe in dogma because now dogma has come, become synonymous with dogmatic. Dogmatic has become synonymous with what? Having a view of something. There were several, several leftist, hardcore leftist people in my previous church. And they called me dogmatic all the time. If I had an opinion on something, they boom, right off the bat, that you're being dogmatic. If I had an opinion about anything, I think Jesus rose from the dead. You're being dogmatic. I think the New Testament Christians cared a lot about us living holy lives. You're a legalist. You're dogmatic. This is absolute nonsense. And this is a nonsense just because it hurt my feelings. That didn't hurt my feelings. That's just gibberish. This valuing doubting, valuing questioning, valuing not being dogmatic, but having beliefs is just a way of being part of the cool crowd. I've got beliefs. Yeah, but I'm not dogmatic. What that means is I have preferences, but not beliefs. You just have preferences. Today, I feel like a woman. Tomorrow, I'm going to feel like a man. Today, I feel like God is real. Tomorrow, I feel like he's not. But I'm just, you know, I'm just fluid. I'm just all over the place. I'm not dogmatic about anything. I'm just, it just depends on my indigestion and the weather and whether or not I eat chocolate that day or whether or not, quite frankly, whether or not I have a peer group who accepts me. You can do that if you want. I just wish you would never, ever, ever say you're a Christian. And two, don't ever say that's what the Bible says. No biblical author thinks that what faith is. No biblical author would concur with you. Because that is, it's just abject pablum. Another thing is very common about progressive Christianity is this joining in between all the different worlds. But again, it's just part of attention. And a lot, that's what almost everybody comes down to it anyway. Everything. Everybody just wants attention. They just need attention so badly. That doesn't mean everyone's opinion is only geared by that. I'm just saying that's a very common motivation. I just want attention. That's why I dye my hair blue and pink. That's why I get tattoos on my face and my and my earlobes and whatever. I mean, that, for so many people, they just want validation. I wear a military uniform and a dress with boots on because why? It's just expressing myself. So people go, oh, wow, look at you. How did that hurt? Wow, look at, wow. Ooh, even if it's negative, but they're getting attention. I know a guy I went to undergraduate with, and he's a, a preacher, speaker, and I eventually had to, anyway, I, I couldn't take it anymore because he, like so many people in that crowd, they talk about themselves so much, and it's one of the clear, uh, clear characteristics of the millennial generation, and this guy's not the millennial generation, but it is one of the characteristics of the millennial generation. Uh, he's not too far removed from it. And then as they talk about themselves all the time, all the time. At one time I heard him on the talk, he was raised Pentecostal. And he said, I'm at a weird place now. I'm in between all these different worlds. And you know, I've got fundamentalist conservative friends and gay friends and progressive and liberal. I'm just all over. I'm just all over. And he spent like five or 10 minutes talking about this. And I thought, who cares? Who cares? Who gives a rip? Why, why is it? Why is it okay? for anybody, not to mention indicative of this crowd, to talk about themselves all the time. My experience with church was so bad, and here's what I did to get over, and I have struggled with this, and I have this, and someone else goes, me too. I, mine was worse. I was this, and my parents, and my church, and I, and I, and someone else, and I, share me your story. And it, it just breeds this incessant narcissistic culture in which we live. Newsflash, man. No one really cares. Most people don't give a rip about you anyway. They, they're not going to want to hear your story. I mean, I'm sorry about it. That's just true. And I understand telling your story if it's apropos. There's some time to tell a story because it matters in the moment or you're making a point or someone says, what is your story? Or how did you come to hold your views? Or tell me about your childhood. Yes. <laughs> I'm, not, it's not, I'm not being all or nothing. I'm not being dogmatic. I'm just saying. It is indicative of this culture and the writings that I have read to talk about themselves all the stinking time. I'm so cool. I'm progressive. I'm in a weird place. I'm in between all these worlds. You know, I just, I'm not like what I used to. And I'm just, I had so weird me, 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 me. And then what you do is after you talk about yourself and how you're so different and you're so out there and you're just not like your mom and daddy's church is then you, you tie Jesus into it. 
You talk about how you love Jesus. What you do, though, it, it makes you more like Jesus. Why? Because you're on the fringe like Jesus was on the fringe. I beat you at being like Jesus. <laughs> I ask, what would Jesus do more than you do? Why? Because I'm on the fringe. I don't fit those molds. I dare to go where no one has gone before. I can hear the Star Trek theme music in the background right now. <laughs> Boldly going where no one has gone before. I hang out with the queers and I hang out with my grandparents. I'm I'm all over. I'm just I'm all over. I they're so cool. This is come on. <sighs> it is progressive to change what Jesus said or to ignore it, but it's also dangerous and wrong. If you're so in love with Jesus, then why not actually believe what he taught? All of it. If you're so in love with Jesus, and you're just coming to a brand new understanding of Jesus, but you still love Jesus, then how is it that you can ignore what he taught? How is it that huge chunks of what Jesus taught no longer matter to you? How is that conceivable? I ju- I'm genuinely, I do not get it. And, you, and you, if you're progressive, I know you don't listen to this anyway, but... If a person is David, then he just, David's dumb or he's obtuse. He doesn't get it. And then you're right. I just don't get it. I do not understand it. If a person said, I follow the ways of Jesus, but I disregard huge chunks of what he said as completely irrelevant and therefore are just wrong, I don't understand it. Why even be a Christian? Just be a, just be a spiritualist. That's what they do. Go be Unitarian. That way you can pick and choose what you want. This reminds me of the other day. I was reading this uh, post on Facebook. I was friends. I got off because I don't, I can't remember why I even signed up as a friend, but he's a a pastor at a church and I've never met him. Um, And he was talking about the woman who died and he said, she, she uh, put Jesus's message of love of God and neighbor and community back at the central of the gospel, back at the center of the gospel. She put Jesus's message of love of God and neighbor and community back at the center of the gospel. What? What? (laughs) Have you read the Gospels before? I'm saying I'm doing it again. I'm sorry. I can't believe this. This guy is a pastor. Have you read Mark 1, 14 to 15? Did it say, did it say, after John the baptizer was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God saying, love God and neighbor. The end. Or did it? Or did it say? Be repenting and be believing the kingdom of God is at hand. Which one is it? Yes, Jesus taught Mark 12, 29 to 31, that we should love God, our hearts, our strength, and mind, love our neighbor as ourselves, and Luke 6, love enemies. And so absolutely he did. But that is not the center of the gospel. The center of the gospel is that the kingdom of God, Jesus' teaching and ministry, is the embodiment of God's reign and rule and the only immediate necessary thing to do in response to his message is repent. Why? Because the people, everybody who heard his message was a sinner. To whom was he preaching? People who needed Jesus, they needed the great, they needed the kingdom of God. These are people who needed to repent. But repent from what, Jesus? If the message of Jesus is just loving people, then why do they need to repent at all? People can love God and neighbor and community and stop. They're not sinners. They're just, oh, okay, well, I just need to love people. He, he just means love people more. I just, anyway, I don't, I don't understand it. I just don't understand. I don't, that makes no sense to me. When I read the gospels and then hear people say what Jesus did or didn't believe it, I just, I can't get it. Anyway, the same pastor also talked about this woman who died. He said, I was there in a meeting years ago when she did a talk and, and, um, she, 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 she spoke and she had a and a and all these old white men were there uh, speaking up against her. And he said, he said, they spoke to her, quote, they attempted to use their seminary training to debate her. Attempted to use their seminary training. What? <laughs> I mean, ooh, this is exactly the kind of narrative nonsense of the mean, bigoted, white males tried to dupe her by their sophistry and their so-called seminary training, but she stood up against him like a valiant knight, 
like a lone reed in the desert fighting against the oppression of the heat and Satan himself, she fought back with grace and kindness and taught them what love really meant. That's exactly his whole post. It was a long dissertation on the post. How does a person attempt to use seminary training? Could it be possible, and I mean this, is it possible that they didn't attempt to use their seminary training just to shove their view, but they used seminary training and the biblical training they received to demonstrate what she said was false? Is that possible? Is it in the realm of possibility? Is it possible that every person in the room who disagreed with her wasn't trying to be or nor were being bigots, tyrants, forcing their old sophistry and education down her throat? Is it in the realm of possible even a portion of them just thought she was wrong? Is it possible that she was wrong? No, it can't be. Why? Because she's on the margins, go, daring to go where no one's gone before, and everyone who disagrees with her are bad. bad. And that, that is the narrative. Anyone holds, anyone, and I've read this over and over and over, anyone who holds to traditional orthodox theology of the Christian faith, they're the bad guys. Old, white, elitist, privileged white guys. They're homophobic, bigots, and racist, and they could never understand the ways of Jesus. You have to have a progressive Christian to explain to us what Jesus really meant. No one in the history of Christianity understood the message of Jesus until, praise Jesus, he finally sent these Lone Ranger voices who hated the church because they hurt them so bad and have come back to the church to cleanse her and correct her of all their sins. And their sins aren't really their fault, but they kind of are. Their sins are just because they're old and white and apparently seminary trained. See, instead of dealing with the arguments people make, you just do attack the people because they're white or their education. It's just a constant ad hominem. That's all. I have read from people who disagree with me. I've read, and most of the time, they don't make arguments. They just to appeal to ad hominem stuff. Dave, you can't understand because you're white. You can't understand what Jesus meant because you're a man. You don't know. You don't. You can't grasp it. <laughs> it reminds me. <laughs> Years ago, back when Rob Bell was a thing, and he was Mr. Popular and so forth, he was kind of an early example of these progressive cool christians he was on unbelievable the podcast which i like um and he was doing one to another guy and talk about homosexuality and christianity and the, the host said but I'm, I'm paraphrasing it doesn't matter the quote go listen to yourself but do you believe that basically people can be gay or is that a good thing and so forth and the guy he said you know yeah and why is that and his answer basically was and he said this i know gay people they love each other and they love Jesus. <laughs> In the history of Judaism and Christianity, Rob, let me ask you a question. Have Jews and Christians for two and 3,000 years respectively believed that homosexual behavior is a sin? Well, I know gay people and they love each other. They love Jesus. Hey, Rob, let me ask you a question. Why is it a good thing for gay people to go against the teaching of Jesus in like Mark chapter 10, Matthew 19, when it says marriage between a man and a woman? Well, because I know gay people. See, <laughs> what? I know gossips and they love Jesus. Therefore, gossip is righteous. I know people who have stolen things, but they love Jesus. Therefore, stealing things, being a thief is good. I know people who are drunkards and they love Jesus. Therefore, getting drunk is good. You hear all nonsense. This, these aren't arguments for sound exegesis. This is appealing strictly and only to my own personal experience. It's my personal truth. And that's crap. It's my personal truth that people won't stop saying. The reason why it's okay, the reason why it's righteous for anything at all, is because it fits my personal truth. And as long as I've experienced it, that's enough. We're in bad shape. <laughs> We're in bad shape. We are in bad shape and it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's just getting worse. I'll end on where I start out by a big chunk of where I started out. And that is to say, 
I genuinely believe that for the sake of argument and for the sake of the benefit of the doubt, and I try to give the benefit of the doubt, that most, if not all, people who call themselves progressive Christians are convinced they're doing the right thing. They are accurately representing the overarching theme or message of Jesus. And they do that, however, by ignoring huge chunks of what he taught and what the early church taught. Secondly, my major critique is it seems to me that it's driven by these deep psychological transference things going on with mom and daddy or mom and daddy's church or authoritarian kind of view of things and their rebellion and their pain from that and they're coming on the other side of it where you shake off all the authoritarian stuff so you can't have beliefs. That's called dogma. You can't have a view. You can't have a view on anything. That's dogma or legalism. You have to be constantly opening and doubting. You have to listen to everyone's story because they love to talk by themselves. It's full of meism and narcissism. And their story, their experience makes it true. I can't describe how much this is not about the New Testament. Nothing I've just described fits anything of the ancient first century church's experience. I picture sometimes Jesus going to some of these rallies with the picket signs and so forth. And I just picture him shaking his head. Maybe I'm dead wrong, but I can read both English and I can read Greek. And Jesus never once said, love is love. He never once said, kindness is everything. He never once said, black lives matter. He never once said, a woman can do what she wants with her body, including killing babies' bodies inside her body. I've never read that anywhere in the New Testament. I've never read anywhere in the New Testament that that sexual behavior is a free-for-all. As long as you love each other, as long as you're faithful, and as long as you're monogamous, everything's good and cool. I can't understand it. And so church, sister, brother, if you're listening to this, please first, please forgive me if I've been too mean for you. I'm not trying to be mean for you. I do get riled up when I'm convinced they're radically misrepresenting the teaching of Jesus. But secondly, I encourage you to think carefully and critically about the ideas, not the people. Though I do think some transference is going on. That's not a critique. That's not like they're crazy or they're dumb or they're evil. I think that's what's going on but about the people themselves. They might be phenomenally awesome, loving, wonderful people. And I bet most of them are. I bet I could be friends with lots of them, even though we profoundly disagree. So if my encouragement is, whatever it's worth is, don't spend or waste energy doing ad hominem talks, but listen to the arguments and critique them, including my own. If you find that I am misrepresenting the biblical text, I'm serious. If I am misrepresenting the Christian views according to Jesus in the early church, then just don't ever listen to my podcast again because I can't get any better, I think, than I can right now, <laughs> though I'm trying. Uh, or let me see the air remote. Show me Bible verses that it gets, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but this stuff is just, it's a new day. It's a new day. And may God give us grace for all of us and all of our scrubs. <laughs> Please help us give us clarity on this. Uh, man, give us clarity. We'll keep praying for each other. Wait, before you click stop on that podcast, you need to go to davidpendergrass.com. And check out more information at davidpendergrass.com. Also, follow me on Twitter at Dr. D. Pendergrass, at Dr. D. Pendergrass, or follow me on Facebook. Go to Facebook and look up Glimpse of the Kingdom, Glimpse of the Kingdom. Do you have more questions for me? Theological questions, questions on relationships, counseling, whatever it might be, send me an email. Again, go to my website. You can contact me there or even on Facebook, and I'll reach out to you just as fast as I can. God bless you.